he finishes the story. I'm crying. Everybody in the room is crying. He gets the standing ovation. I go run over to him and I throw my arms around him. And he puts his head in my neck and he says, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. And I said, I do, Tony. You just found your swagger. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Finding Your Bliss, the show that helps you find and follow your bliss. I'm Judy Liebrack, and today we have former TV host, advertising creative director, training guru, and now author of a fabulous new book. I have it right here called Swagger. This is a little dog-eared because I've been reading it like crazy. It's called Swagger, Unleash Everything You Are and Become Everything You Want. Leslie M. is in the house, and well, sort of, it's COVID, so she's in her house and we're about to do this interview remotely later on in the program we have piano virtuoso robert horvath who will be playing a magnificent arrangement of el latigo from the piadora contemporary chamber music ensemble and he might even be playing live for us as well right here on the program but first let me tell you a little bit more about my first guest so as I just mentioned, Leslie M. is a swagger coach, and we're going to find out exactly what that means. She is a training guru, a speaker, and an author who has helped thousands of professionals discover and unleash their unique brand of swagger and find success just by being who they really are, their authentic selves. She's a former TV host, and she spent 15 years traveling the globe with her award-winning training company, Combustion, helping top executives, leaders, and teams in Fortune 100 companies learn how to embrace their superpowers and really how to find their voices and just become, as Leslie puts it, the badasses they were born to be. And now she's put all of her tips, tricks, insights, and tales of inspiration into this fabulous book called Swagger unleash everything you are and become everything you want. She's worked for such impressive organizations. I couldn't believe this list. Google and Disney and PepsiCo and TD Bank and Uber and many more. Leslie is not only the author of Swagger, but she devotes a lot of her time now to also working as a Swagger coach. And she's an awesome speaker. I've heard her speak. And she's also a passionate amateur boxer. So cool. And a fighter for good. Hi, Leslie. Welcome to Finding Your Bliss. Long, long bio. <laughs> Can, can I just take you everywhere to be my hype woman? Can I just carry you around with me? Let us jump in. I'm just going to let Judy read all my crayons. Thank you so much. So impressive stuff. I, I have to say congratulations on the book. As my producer, Siobhan, who you just met, uh, said, it's like having a sassy friend along with you on your journey, teaching you how to have swagger. What exactly is swagger? So first, let's clarify, because I'm not talking about the old swagger, you know, that negative, arrogant, show offy, peacocky, in your face, machismo thing. That is not my kind of swagger. The way that I have redefined it is the ability to manifest who you really are and hold on to it in the face of all of that psychological crap that's going to come for it, regardless of the situation or environment. So there is only one you. And you take that one you with you wherever you go and whomever you're with. The book is amazing. It's your brainchild. And I love that it's sort of taken on a life of its own. What inspired you to write it? What made you be burning to write this book? All of the years that I spent working with these you know, executives that you listed off in my considerable bio, I... I found that there was like this singular human truth that ran through everyone that I worked with. And it didn't seem to matter the level of the individual, the company they came from, the culture, the country, because I really worked all around the world. The thing that was true of just about everyone was that they didn't believe that who they were authentically was good enough to allow them to succeed. Wow. that they just had to do something to who they were to make themselves more credible, more acceptable, more lovable, more professional, more, 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 that who they were just wasn't good enough. And when I discovered that, it was this giant aha, because I am crazy passionate about unleashing human potential. And I realized that all of the training that I could do on subject matter expertise, leadership, presentation skills, communication, was going to count for nothing hmm. until I was able to unlock the human being that had to execute on these skills. And that's where I decided to place 
my focus because when I started to do that, the transformations that I saw were unfreaking believable. There was much crying in many rooms and a lot of it was my crying because it blew my mind and I thought, this is it. This is my life's purpose. Well, even even when the CEO cried in the book, that was like such a momentous thing because he was someone who never showed his emotions and suddenly he did it. And that must have been very scary for him thinking like, oh, no one's going to respect me. But in fact, it did the opposite, right? It made people connect to him. And, That's right. And, and you're great at helping people deeply connect to people. But Leslie, there's many things that prevent us from unleashing our swagger. You call them swagger blockers. And one of the first ones you talk about that separates the real you from the world is your persona. So what do you mean by persona and how can you align your persona with your true self? We all have a way that we think we need to show up in order to be credible, to be taken seriously, to be worthy of, of something. And we learn that from the people around us. Mm -hmm. We learn it from what we see uh, at work. We learn it from our leaders. We learn it from, you know, people in our family. And what we start to do is adopt those behaviors <laughs> yeah. as our own. Right. And they're not our own. They're learned behaviors based on these things that we're seeing. And what happens over time is the more we buy into that, the more we buy into that environment, the less uh, we are ourselves, the mm -hmm. less we are able to manifest the stuff that is truly our differentiator, because we start to believe that that's the only way that we're going to be acceptable to the world. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's quite the opposite. You say another swagger blocker is ambition. What's the difference between blind ambition and just being in your place of excellence? Ambition has a way of changing us. You know, if we're if we're super focused on that ladder, yes, we tend to look upwards. We tend to be focused on what's what's up there. I want that thing that is next. And when we focus upwards, by definition, we're not focusing inwards enough. We're not focusing to to the left and right to our peers right. and to our colleagues. And we're sure as heck not focusing enough on our followers. And the truth is that if we focus on those people, on our, our colleagues and peers and our followers, they're going to lift us to that place that we want to be. And we don't have to spend so much time climbing. Um, we also can go deeper into that, that persona mythology, because if we tell ourselves that in order for me to ascend, I have to behave a certain way or mm. walk or talk or dress or act a certain way, then we start to move further away from, from who we are mm -hmm. and more towards that more assimilated version of ourselves. So for me, the, the secret is to being in your place of excellence mm -hmm. and doing your best work in service of the collective. I'm all for ambition as an aspiration, but it's when it starts to tip into controlling your behavior or minimizing or limit, limiting your, your persona, then I'm not for it anymore. Right, 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 right. I, I love also that you talk about insecurity and fear, which is so true for all of us, our two other swagger blockers. How do we face down our fear factor? Because sometimes it is scary when you're standing in front of a crowd of a thousand people or you're doing a new a new venture in your in your field and you do feel afraid. So are you supposed to pretend that you're not like, you know, fake it till you make it or no, 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 no. We do not ever want to fake it till you make it. It's the worst advice that anybody could give. It's the worst advice that anybody could take. Because right. here's the thing about the whole fake it till you make it. The thing that we're trying to fake is confidence. Mm -hmm. That's what we want people to believe that we have, even though we don't actually have it. Mm -hmm. And we cannot, we cannot fake confidence. Confidence can only come as a result of competence. Right. Only when we've done something over and over and over again and proven to our own resistance, resistant brains that we have a baseline of, of ability. Yeah. And we know that you could throw us into a million situations and we'd be pretty much okay. That's when we have legitimate confidence. So when we fake it, we throw ourselves into mm. that whole imposter syndrome. Yeah. We throw ourselves into deep insecurity because that that fear that we're going to be found out is legitimate right. because we may well be found out. So what I, what I tell people to do is to accept where they are in their journey. 
Mm -hmm. Everybody came from a place of not knowing at some point. And every time we change and we grow, we go back to that place of not knowing as much as we did before. It is part of our human development and every single human on the planet experiences it. So why are we pretending that we're supposed to magically leap from a place of not knowing to a place of expertise? I mean, that's, you know, that's what the journey is all about. Do you suggest then in a talk, I always think about the stand-up comedian who's insecure and then people throw tomatoes at him or her, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to when that guy sort of gets up or girl and, and has a little more swagger and a little more confidence and tends to do have a better set, do a better gig. So how do you sort of like balance the confidence part of it with the realness part of it? I, I think that's a great example, actually, for stand-up comedians, because if you look at the at the array of styles that stand-up comedians have, some of their styles are to be very unassuming and very kind of meek and, and very shy and introverted. And some others walk around the stage like they own it. Yeah. Some people are self-deprecating. Some people are direct. That's about their authentic style. That's what works for them. Right. So there's not one, you know, approved way of doing things. And I think that what we're talking about here is self-belief, mm -hmm. which is very different than confidence. Yeah. Self-belief does not require you to have all of this experience and all of this credibility. It's, it's this unerring internal feeling that you can take a step off that cliff and the thing you know for sure is that you're not going to die. Yes. You know, it's part of the question that you ask yourself. You say, what's the worst thing that can happen? So in that, in that case, tomatoes is the worst thing that could happen to you. And you know what? They wash off and you live and learn. It's right. the worst, you know, who cares? Were you always like this, Leslie? Is this something that was inbred and built into you and your family that you always had this get confidence, swagger, whatever word, uh, let's say swagger, because that's your book. Uh, it, or is it something you've had to work on? Well, Okay. First of all, let me just tell you that swagger is a lifelong journey. So whether you start with some, you're still going to have to do the work for the rest of your life. It's not a, a switch that you flip. Yeah. My The advantage that I had over many, many people was that I was raised by parents who really fueled my individuality. They told me that I was creative and wacky and wild and smart and irreverent and all of those things and didn't ask me to assimilate. They they taught me about the game of life and how to play it and how to win it. And they reminded me day in and day out, and particularly my mother, that I could do anything in this world. And both my sister and I grew up with this mindset that allowed us to be highly successful because when when we wanted to do something, when we had a dream and we would you know, <laughs> express that dream, my mother would, would look at us and she would say, well, why not you? Absolutely. Someone's got to do that cool <laughs> thing. Someone's got to have that great gig. Someone's got to experience that. Why not you? What's stopping you? And she didn't just ask the question. She would wait for an answer. That's so fast. She wasn't playing, right? So I was very, very fortunate in that. But listen, I had struggles just like everybody else. You know, fitting in feels good. It feels good. Yeah. But standing out feels better. This wow. is what I've learned. Oh, I love that. I love that. That gives me the chills. Um, I adore your chapter 10 on swagger drivers. And you talk about the three key ones, which are truth, intention, and you just mentioned one of them, self-belief. And I would think truth is where it all begins, like to thine own self be true. But I really got excited about the chapter on intention. What do you mean when you say intention is everything? You have to know why you're trying to drive your swagger into the world. Why are you expressing your truth? And if you're not clear on your intention, there's a really good chance it's not going to work out well for you. Mm -hmm. Because um, if we are speaking our truth simply to be heard, other people aren't going to care so yeah, much. So you exciting. know what I mean? Yeah. You just you, It's <laughs> like you're running around with your hair on fire screaming, I must speak my truth. And people go... <laughs> Oh, Whatever. Right. So right. one of the keys, one of the secrets to swagger is that you've got to figure out that alignment between your truth and the benefit of others. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just for you, probably not going to catch on. 
But there's always a way to reframe your truth in such a way that other people understand what's good for them. So let's say in a, you know, in, in a work setting, you're having a challenge with a boss, you're having a hard time with them, and you get the opportunity to sit down for a one on one. Now you could say nothing, you could take your review from them. And you could go thank you very much, because you want to keep your head down and off you go. But is that really good for you? or the boss, because that boss is not getting the best out of you. You're resentful, you're frustrated, you're, you're limited, you're, you know, you're not being able to bring your full self to the party. Mm. So instead, if you were able to say to them, hey, listen, I'm finding that our styles are a little conflicting. So I want to try and have a conversation about how we can work better together so that you can get the best out of me. Awesome. So I can be the best contributor to the team, to the environment, to, to the work. That person is going to hear that truth. You've still spoken your truth. You just found a way to frame it as opposed to saying, I think you're an idiot. Right. right you know, which absolutely. is not which is not going to work. Or you bug me or or you know, I'm not happy. It's not going to work. So it's about reframing it in such a way and knowing that your intention is ultimately to contribute to the greater good. That's so awesome. Not it's a win-win. It's a win-win. Yeah. You're not attacking yeah. the person. You're including them and they're winning because they're going to improve and they're going to get the best out of you, which is great for the company. So cool. I love that. Okay. So my favorite part of your book is your swagger mantra. And in fact, I did it on one of my best friends last night, Mary, Mary Lawless, wherever you are. Uh -huh. uh, yes. And I actually filled in the blanks and wrote mine down. And I'm going to- Okay. I want to hear it? I want to hear it. Here it is. Here it is. And it said, I'm a bliss fairy whose intention is always to help people find their bliss. And I believe in myself because, and Leslie, here's the part I can't say out loud, but I'm going to say it. Let's do it. Uh, okay. I believe in myself because I'm great at it. I have a knack for it. I'm great at helping people find their bliss. I, I could do it. That's yes, it. girl. Yes. Speak Woo! that swag of truth. <laughs> Speak it. Feels good, right? Le Leslie, I can't tell you. My friend, Mary Lawless, who is a wonderful yoga meditation, she's kind of like a saint angel on this planet kind of person. And she did it. And it was so beautiful what she wrote just about being a healer, which is what she is. And uh, just it, it works for everyone. It's so brilliant. I think it's yeah. one of the coolest things. Everyone has to get this book, Swagger, to, to fill in that mantra and then use it. Use it as a mantra meditation so that mm -hmm. it becomes true. Is that the idea is that you, you build it into your everyday vernacular? Yeah, we have to we have to record over those those negative tapes that play in our head. We can't just ignore them. That's our psyche talking. And and most of us have had that voice in our heads that's been built up over decades and decades of of having our our souls kind of chipped away at. You know, often it starts in our homes. Our parents are incredibly well-intentioned, but they say stuff. Right. And and we hear what we want to hear and it hurts us. And we stay wounded for for many 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 years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if any time we hear something that we think validates that original wound, it just builds and builds and builds and builds. And before long, we start to believe that that's who we are. And uh, one of the things I say, I say in the book is you are not your history. You are the stories you tell yourself. Yes. So you have to start to change those stories. And when you, you do that swagger mantra, it's one of those things that is a reminder. So when the negative voices come, you can go, oh, oh, oh wait a second. Wow. I am a bliss fairy. <laughs> <laughs> right? And you just give it, you just give it back to that voice. And and what I wanted to do with the book was you'll see there are there are exercises throughout the entire book. They're awesome. Right? The entire book. Because I come from a training background, I didn't want this to be fluffy, woofy, airy, fairy, inspiration only. I was not gonna play that. I wanted this to be a a best friend Sherpa. Who will who would hold your hand through the process of of discovering and unleashing your swagger and that you knew that you could take those little steps in practical ways and test the theories and learn so it this book doesn't play it is you're gonna do the work with it and you will find that step by step you're, you're going to experience massive change it's, they're so great. I actually did some of the exercises on our team as we were preparing for this. I said, you got to hear this one. You got to hear that one. They, really, they're they're so fantastic. I love your 10-point proof of swagger checklist. What can leaders do to build a culture of swagger? Like, how can you make swagger something that everyone on the team can enjoy? 
It's incredibly important for leaders to model swagger because so many of the bad habits that we develop and and all of the swagger blockers that we buy into are as a result of us watching our bosses. That's how we learn a lot of the negative things. And ironically, the leaders that we love the most are the ones who are the most authentic, the most transparent, the most open, the most approachable, the most genuine, all of those things that we're afraid to be ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the more that leaders walk the swagger talk, the more they're showing their people that this, that it's a safe space for them to bring their full selves to the party. Because think about the good sense of it. If you have a team of people and as a result of their lack of psychological safety, mm-hmm. they're only bringing a percentage of, of themselves to right. the work party, right. then you're, you're paying for the whole employee, but you're only getting 60% because they're hiding the most vulnerable, which is probably their most creative and their most interesting and where all their best ideas lie and where all their greatest, you know, innovation thoughts and, and, um, you know, challenges come from. That's the stuff that they're not bringing to the party. So it's inc- that's the most important thing is for leaders to model it. Mm-hmm. And then they have to speak their truth and encourage others to speak their truth in return. And when they see behavior that is swagger hating, <laughs> they need to shut it down. They got to <laughs> shut it down. Okay. So we've got someone like Brene Brown who talks about vulnerability, the power of vulnerability. And then my husband has a belief never show a sign of weakness. What? What's? How do you reconcile that? What's right? Is it Brene Brown's be vulnerable or never show a sign of weakness? Or is there something in between? Like, how do you? I think that um, your husband, bless him, <laughs> probably has the wrong idea of what weakness is. I think that's the fundamental problem, is that uh, the reason that he's so afraid to show weakness mm-hmm. is because he understands how vulnerable he really is. Wow. So he has to put up that front to protect all the soft stuff. Nice. Because if he, if he, I'm not picking on your husband, this is true (laughs) of anybody and everybody. The reason that we put up those walls Mm -hmm. is to protect the most tender, the most real parts of us. But the irony is that when we don't express any kind of vulnerability, when we, do, when we don't show people who we really are, it means we can't really be loved and accepted for who we are. So then we get mad at the world for not acknowledging and loving and respecting who we really are but we're afraid to show it to them. So it's this this horrible catch 22 and I would rather me personally and I think for many people, I would rather be loved for who I really am Mm -hmm. than accepted for who I'm not. Mm -hmm. Because that's not real. It's just not real. It's not based on reality. And then the person's going to find out that you're not really, that's like in a relationship when you pretend to be someone that you're not. And then all of a sudden they find out, She's really not that cool. She's yeah, really, yeah. You know, that's, a, that's the advice that my mother gave me when I was a teenager, when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, living in suburban Montreal, back in the day, with a purple mohawk. <laughs> and people thought I was crazy town. And I was just expressing myself and my family was okay with it, but people would cross the street to avoid me. And believe me, I was not getting a lot of 14-year-old Jewish boy action because they just were not having it. And I, I remember I came home and I cried to my mother one day and said, well, maybe I should just try and be like the other girls. And maybe I should. And she said, ah, 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 ah. She said, you need to be exactly who you are from the first second, because if you pretend to be someone that you're not, to get someone to like you, eventually they're going to find out who you really are and then they're going to reject you and that's going to suck. Absolutely. But if you're yourself 100% and they don't like you from the beginning, no harm, no foul. And she said, (laughs) and she said, if a guy is too dumb to recognize what an amazing girl you are, what would you want to go with such a dumb guy for anyway? Exactly. Mother mic drop. It was like the best wisdom, and I've applied that wisdom to every aspect of my life. If a company is too dumb to recognize what an amazing asset I would be, what would I want to do work for that dumb company? If a boss is too dumb to recognize what an amazing <laughs> asset I am, why would I? And so on and so forth. You know, it's really important. But that's about self acceptance. Absolutely, absolutely, so cool. I, I love this stuff. Is there one of your uh, 
business people that you've coached that's is do you have a favorite swagger success story like i the one i keep thinking about is the guy with that revealed his tattoos and rolled back his shirt sleeves and He's what a dichotomy but is there one that stands out for you as just like the epitome of wow i really i really help these people well, I mean, there are so many. There's a story that I have at the very beginning of the book, which whenever I whenever I tell it, I end up crying because it's still so visceral for me. It's such a beautiful story. And um, I'm going to tell the story in a really short, in a really, the really short form. So I was doing presentation skills training with financial services professionals, very senior guys. This group happened to be all male. And what I do is I get them up one by one to pull a, a talking strip out of a hat. And then I kind of watch them do their thing, make some notes and give them feedback so I can get them to the next level. And I'm looking beyond the exterior. I'm looking right into their souls and they don't know it. So I did this on one occasion and I had this guy get up. His name was Tony. And in, as soon as I said, okay, off you go, Tony. He was like, good time, Charlie, with the fingers pointing. He just turned into like the grossest salesman on the planet. He's strutting back and forth. He's all, you know, male frontage first, the whole business. And I went, whoa, 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 Tony, stop. <laughs> what is this? He was like, what, what, so what is all of the, what the heck is this action? And he said, well, I thought you wanted me to, you know, to present. I said, no, 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 Tony, let me tell you, when I look at you, this is what I see. You're the guy who has the cottage next to me. Hmm. And it's five o'clock in the morning and I go down to start my boat to go fishing because I do like to fish <laughs> and my boat doesn't start. I know I can go over to your house, knock on your door. You're going to come out in your boxer shorts and your t-shirt. You're going to help me start my boat. You might drink a beer at 5 a.m. and you might go fishing with me. That's who you really are. And he was like, oh my God, how can you tell that from what I did? I said, because Tony, I can see you. Now cut the crap and just do your thing. I said to Tony, I want you to talk about something that's important to you. And I don't want any of this bull. Go. And he kind of, and he takes this big breath. And you could see his mind just racing. And all of a sudden he says, my mother, my mother, and then goes, oh. And this huge guttural sob wow. wrenches out of him and he turns his back. And I said, keep going, Tony, keep going. He turns around and he said, oh, you know, his tears are starting to roll down his face. I said, keep going. And he started to tell the story of his little Italian mother who had come to Canada and had four sons and had raised them in this, you know, with, with a tenacity and grit. And she had done everything, had sacrificed everything to raise her boys and how essential she was in defining who he was as a man. And as he's talking, tears are streaming down his face. He keeps having to turn his back. People are getting up from the group to mm -hmm. hug him in the moment. And then, and then he reveals that his mother had recently passed away. Oh. And as a result, he had started to lose his sense of who he was as a person because he was so defined by the love that his mother had for him. And he finishes the story. I'm crying. Everybody in the room is crying. He gets the standing ovation. I go run over to him and I throw my arms around him. And he puts his head in my neck and he says, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. And I said, I do, Tony. You just found your swagger. That's fabulous. And, and when I tell that story, I tell that story a lot when I do keynotes. And I said, and of course, Tony's life changed that day. I mean, everybody treated him differently. He was mocked in the halls. He was ridiculed. That was the end of his career. Everything changed. And then I go, really? Not. <laughs> not. Everything changed for Tony that day, but not in the ways that everybody are so afraid. Instead, people were able to connect more deeply with him. Wow. People were able to speak their truth more easily to him. People saw him for who he was, because he wasn't good time Charlie. He was soulful, soulful Tony, and his life changed. Oh, that, your work must be so gratifying and, and so, so incredible. How can finding your full swagger, Leslie, really make you happier? This is finding your bliss and change your life. You start to understand who are the valuable people in your life, mm -hmm. because when we change, other people change around us. Some people won't like it, and if they don't like it, it means that they've probably been able to control you up to now. Yeah. It probably means they've been able to suppress your truth up to now. It probably means that they've been able to diminish you. 
And the fact that you're finding your swagger means that you're not no longer for them, you're for yourself. Yeah. And so those haters will fall away. Mm -hmm. And those people who were neutral about you are probably going to come a lot closer, right? With, with nice. interest and with, with um, trust. And that's going to deepen all of those relationships. You're also going to understand your personal power. And that's everything in this life you, because you're going to understand that you are truly being seen yes. and acknowledged for the first time in your life. And there is nothing that we want more as human beings than that. And if we have the courage to show people who we really are, that's the only time that we can start to be loved and accepted for who we really are. That's it's it's so badass. Cool. It's superpower. It's so, you're, you're, so you know, cool. I, I also found it fascinating that you're a boxer. I don't know why, but I just find that so cool. And I loved your story in the book about how you entered this big championship and you learned the biggest swagger lesson of all because you didn't win, but you felt like you had one. Can yeah. you tell us about that just briefly? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm a highly competitive person, um, <laughs> and uh, but I'm a fighter for good. I, I love boxing. It's the most empowering sport on the planet. I think everybody should do it. I, <laughs> I started to, to box when I was 48 years old, and I went into the ring to fight my first sanctioned amateur bout for the fight day and cancer when I was 51 years old. Wow. And that's after six months of training as an Olympic style boxer. So training two, three hours a day was, it was epic, but I wanted to win. I wanted to win. And so I manifested, I focused, I was, you know, just so in that place of nothing can stop me from winning. And then came the moment of walking into that room with 900 people screaming and cheering my family there. I'd raised $30,000 for Princess Margaret uh, cancer hospital. I had done the training. I'd survived it all. I was ready to go. And I was like, this is it. Kill. <laughs> and all of a sudden, taking in that moment, being present in the moment, I had this epiphany that said, oh my God, Les, you already did it. You are here. You made this journey and you have arrived. And the only thing that's going to be different in nine minutes <laughs> is you're going to move from boxer to fighter. And wow. nobody will be able to take that away from you, whether you, it makes me cry, whether you win or whether you lose. So if you focus on winning, you are not going to be present in this, the most incredible nine minutes of your life that are about to hit you. And so I let it go completely. And I remember every single second of that experience. And it was the best experience of my life. And did I win? Hail to the no, because she was five inches taller than me <laughs> and had a reach of like five inches. But I, as soon as it was done, I turned to my coach and I said, I want to do it again. I want to do it again. So it's, you know, it, it really does have the power to help you reframe things in the moment which is the most important thing. We don't, we, we're not always best, you know, in the planning. Planning is great, but it's the ability to be present in the moment. Absolutely. I love your dedication to your beloved late mother, Evelyn Hen, and AKA Journey Woman. Can you tell us how your mother inspired you to write this book? Do you want me to cry? Because <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Um, from day one, my mother was my biggest champion. And she loved the fact that I was a weirdo and she loved the fact that I had massive superpowers. And she told me that I was going to do great things in this life. And, and I believed her. So whenever I doubted myself, I would just hear her voice in my head telling me that I could do anything that I wanted to do. Um, and that's the greatest gift that you can give your kids because it stayed with me from, from my whole life. Um, and she said to me for probably 25 years, I'm waiting for your book. I'm waiting for your book. You're the smartest person I know. I'm waiting for your book. Um, and my mother was no slouch. You know, my, when my mother passed away, she had 40,000 followers on Twitter and she was 79 years old. So my mother was not your average mother. So when she said that uh, I was the smartest person that she knew, <laughs> it was a high, high, high compliment. Um, and um I, there was probably a lot of stages of my life that I wouldn't have gotten through 
with uh, with as much grace and as much tenacity and as much self esteem as I did, because she was always there to pick me up off the ground and put me back in the ring and say, "You got this, champ. You know, wow. go back in and fight the good fight." And, because she really understood what drove me, and that was love. Because I'm really all about love. What a blessing you are! And- your, you are your mother's daughter. What what a beautiful <laughs> blessing. What is bliss for Leslie M? Uh, unleashing human potential, being in service of, of other humans and watching them step into themselves. It's the greatest joy in the world. And I'm so blessed that I get to do it. And like, I do it hardcore uh, and I'm, I get to bring my whole self to that party. So I'm super, super blessed. So are we to have had this wonderful hour with you. I want to thank you so much for being here and for sharing this fantastic book, Swagger, which as you can see, there's a lot to this, guys. It's swagger, unleash everything you are and become everything you want. And uh, you're a wonderful person. So I learned Thank that you. in this hour. And you and- got me to the too, which is a first for me. It's a podcast first. It's an interview first. What is the best way, Leslie, for people to contact you and connect with you on social media and, of course, to get copies of your beautiful book? And they should get two, one for them and one for a best friend. Oh, yes, they should. And they can do the exercises together. Um, so a couple of things. You can follow me on Instagram because I'm, I'm kind of fun and crazy town on Instagram. Uh, that's at Leslie M Speaks. I'm on LinkedIn at Leslie M. On Twitter at Leslie M. Facebook at Leslie M Speaks. LeslieM.com is my business site. You can also check out all book-related things at Swagger the Book. And here's a little, a little tip for you. If you join the Swagger Collective, which is just kind of my, the posse of this growing community of people who are working on unleashing their swagger, and you do order or pre-order the book and send it to me, uh, send me the proof of pre-order. I'm going to give you a complimentary workbook, a 40-page workbook that goes along with this book. I pulled out all the exercises and added a whole bunch of bonus ones so you can really do the work without marking up the beautiful book. Because, oh. you, you know, you can do that, but so you don't have to. So you could do that. Uh, you could do that as well. And the book is uh, is out as of May 10th. Um, you can get it on all the big booksellers, all the Amazons and the Indigos and the Barnes and Noble and Books a Million and all that good stuff. So we are almost there. Awesome. That's so exciting. And congratulations. And I really loved speaking with you today. Thank you so much for being here. It was really great. It was really great. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. We're going to go on a short commercial break and we come back more of Find Your Bliss with Virtue Oso pianist and composer Robert Horvath back in a moment. We are back, and this is Finding Your Bliss on Zoomer Radio, AM 740, FM 96.7. And we're joined now by pianist and composer Robert Horvath. Robert Horvath is a classical concert pianist. He earned his master's degree in classical piano performance and pedagogy from the prestigious Franz Litz Academy of Music in Budapest in 1995. The great Canadian star pianist Valerie Tryon talked about Robert as being a fine pianist with great musical imagination and sensitivity. In addition to his outstanding classical skills, Robert is the pianist of the great and famous Piadora Tango Ensemble. His versatility extends to the idioms of jazz, Argentinian tango, and musical theater. Robert is a popular soloist with the Cathedral Bluff Symphony Orchestra, He performed Rachmaninoff's first and second piano concertos, Chopin's first piano concerto, and performed four of Bach's keyboard concertos on the very same day. An important priority for for Robert Horvath is music education. He is deeply committed to teaching music and is a wonderful teacher and the founder of the Horvath School of Music in Toronto, Forest Hill area, which began in 2002. Just a few of the many venues and series Robert Horvath has appeared at include Roy Thompson Hall, the St. Lawrence Centre for the Arts, Kerner Hall, the Richard Bradshaw Amphitheatre, as well as the Ottawa Chamber Fest, Festival of the Sound, the Collingwood Festival, and the Indian River Festival. In the summer of 2019, he was featured with the Piadora Tango Ensemble in the Vancouver Island Music Fest 
and on Vancouver's prestigious Music in the Morning series. Toured in Ontario and in Florida with the Payadora Ensemble. And we're going to learn, be learning all about this beautiful Payadora music today. Robert, welcome to Finding Your Bliss. Thank you very much and welcome uh, to the listeners as well. And thank you very much, Judy, for having me in your beautiful show, which I am a big fan of. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Robert, can you tell us more about the Payadora Tango Ensemble? Yes. Uh, the Payadora, I joined the Payadora Tango Ensemble uh, around five years ago, and uh, I we became the Payadorian family, <laughs> we, we always say, because we really, in normal cases, when it's no, no pandemics, we are getting together usually at uh, our violinist Rebecca Volkstein and Drew Jurekas, who is our bandoneon uh, uh, nest, basically, and and the producer of our producer of our two albums, what we have made uh, uh, in the past. So we get together at their house. Uh, and then and then we just go for even 2 a.m. <laughs> so for rehearsing and figuring out uh, arrangements and uh, whatnot. So, yes, Poyadora Tango Ensemble is a very special uh, uh, gatherings of excellent musicians, as I said, uh, on violin, Rebecca Wolkstein, uh, her husband, Drew Jureka on, on Bandoneon. Both of them are multi-instrumentalists as well. Uh, Joe, Joseph Phillips on double bass and myself on piano. And our essential part of that, although we all have our master's degree in classical music, but we play every genre of the music. So including jazz, obviously Argentinian tango now, and uh, all of us are in world music as well. So, so it's just a combination of musicians who are, uh, we, we, it's, it's allowing to the, the music to be created in a very generous way and, uh, and, and beauty. So I am so fortunate to be part of it. So what we're going to be listening to is the Payadora Tango, El Latigo. Let's have a listen to this beautiful music right now. Oh my God, that was gorgeous, Robert. Congratulations. I love that. It's so feel good. It just makes you feel good, which we all need during these times, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then that uh, the translation of El Latigo is the whip. <laughs> the whip, really. So that energy is in that piece very much. And then uh, this is originally uh, composed by 
uh, Juan uh, D'Arienzo, uh, who I uh, really admire his compositions. And then this is the transcription and arrangement I have made for the Payadura. Um, and uh, I am I am very, very honored to uh, be part of the collaboration with the Point Tango Dance Company. Uh, uh, there are two wonderful uh, dancers, Alexander Richardson and Erin Scott Kafadar, uh, who we made a beautiful one hour long movie. It's called Tango in the Dark. And then it was uh, showcased uh, on Valentine's Day. And actually, uh, it's still available for downloading the movie or buying the ticket for it at the pointtango.com or uh, payadora.com as well. Uh, so um, I encourage everyone who is uh, who is interested and would like to try to dance, especially in these times. Maybe we have time for it. <laughs> That's so fantastic. I love that that people can still uh, see this beautiful uh, film, Tango in the Dark, and uh, your involvement in it, which, of course, is the beautiful El Latigo that we just heard. Also, Robert, I know you from the Robert Horvath School of Music, as both of my children studied uh, piano with you. And I remember so fondly for many, many years, your beautiful recitals. And my daughter, Lily, would not only play, but she would sing at them. And that was Great always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. During COVID, Robert, are you able to teach? And what is new in the Robert Horvath School of Music these days? Yes, I am. I am very fortunate. I I could say because I, since I'm a musician and teacher, uh, it's just that unprecedented time is really proving to me that uh, the how much the music is filling our lives mm -hmm. because uh, I am teaching online and then uh, I cannot say anything else. Just I am truly blessed that I didn't have any shortfall in students. So all of my students continued. We are having the online lessons. Of course, I prefer the uh, in-person lessons, but but what's amazing that my students are still improving and, and, uh, and practicing and even I would say even more than in normal, uh, because they feel also that how much the music can fill up that gap, what all of us have in that uh, pandemic time. So I am I am very grateful. I'm just going to ask you very briefly because we're almost out of time. But Robert, what is bliss for you these days? Uh, the music, <laughs> in short, the music, and then the chance that I can still contribute. Uh, and be part of, of people around me by the music, strictly by the music, because otherwise it's very limited to be in contact. And then through recording, to, uh, through uh, online concerts or online teaching, I, I, can, I can be part of, of my surroundings, right? And, and then we contacted with people. So um, uh, that's, that's my... True bliss. That's <laughs> so say. fantastic. Are you in front of your piano right now, Robert? Yes, I am. Would you just play two or three bars? We're out of time, but two or three bars of yes. anything live. I'd love it. Yes. <laughs> That made me cry. That's so beautiful. So, <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you, Robert Horvath, for being here today. You're so wonderful. You're so talented. And I'm so excited for people to listen to your beautiful music. Each week, we spotlight a singer, songwriter, or musician on the show. If you're a singer, please write to us at music at findingyourbliss.com. If you're an author, writer, artist, or anyone who has found and is following their bliss, we would love to hear from you. You can also write to us at FYB at findingyourbliss.com. And we encourage you to visit us at our Finding Your Bliss magazine online. 
findingyourbliss.com. And of course, you can always find us at The Bliss Minute on Instagram and Facebook.